Welcome to Slate Church Online. We are so glad that you're tuning in today, and we pray that this message will bless you no matter where you're watching from. If this message impacts you today, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. Hey, listen, why don't you guys grab your seat as you do, turn to the best looking person around you, tell them you're happy to see him right now. <laughs> I know I said the same thing last week as well, but I wanted to say it again just in case your crush wasn't here last week. I want to give you another chance. Um, by the way, I had nobody thank me last week. Uh, so listen, if I'm helping you out right now, come and thank me after the service, all right? Just want to see relationships at Slate Church, that's all. Uh, <laughs> you know, I did have one guy last week t tell me, and um, jokingly, but uh, I think there was some truth in the joke. He, he told me that, um, you know, he would, he would be offended if another man turned first to his wife, Right? <laughs> But he said he would also be offended if nobody turned to his wife at all. So it was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's a lose-lose situation. I'm sorry about that. But, um, hey, you ready, uh, you ready for church tonight? You excited to be here? Come on, hasn't it been an awesome service so far? Come on, God's doing something tonight. I, I'm really looking forward to this service tonight. If it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here. If you don't know who I am, as Brandon said, my name is Luke Betger, one of the lead pastors here. Such a privilege to pastor with my wife, Victoria, and to pastor alongside the legendary Brandon and Emma Richardson. I decided to throw the legendary in today. Why not? And uh, you only got one person clapping for that. So, I mean, that was uh... Jonathan. Thanks, man. You're always there. Right on. But just to reiterate a little bit of what Brandon has been saying, we are so thrilled with what God is doing here at Slate Church. We're so excited for what he's done in these last 11 months. For us as a church, we've seen so many lives impacted. But we are also excited for the time when we can look back after we've been at church for 11 years and see what God has done. Yeah, I know some of you can't even, can't even like think that far ahead, right? You don't even know what's happening next week. But listen, I am so excited when we have been a church for 11 years and get to look back over the many lives who have been changed and impacted because of what we're doing and because of the love of Jesus Christ. You know, I really believe that at that time, you know, we're just going to see so many people coming to church that we're going to have problems like there's no venue in this city that's going to be able to hold us, right? There's not going to be a single place that's big enough for us. I'm so excited to have some of those kind of issues to have to face. And, and, and same thing in Elmira, right? There's not going to be any venue that's actually able to contain us there. I think we're already in one of the biggest venues in Elmira, to tell you the truth. But I'm so excited for what God is doing. We're so thrilled for what he's going to continue to do in our church. And, you know, speaking of, uh, of time and, and this, this idea of years, this past Friday marked uh, one year since my wife Victoria and I moved from Sweden here to Canada to launch Slate Church together with Brandon and Emma. And uh, it's crazy how fast time goes. It's an unbelievable thing. But I'm so glad that we actually took that step out, and God has been so faithful to us in this last year. I mean, he's been so faithful. It's been incredible to see what he's done just in our lives. And I know that I can speak for all of us as lead pastors when I say that we love this church. I mean, we love this church. We truly love it. And, and we love every single person in this church, right? You know, as much as we love, like, uh, you know, all the lights and whatever, that's not really what we love when we say we love the church. When we say we love the church, it means we actually love every single person that's attending our church, that calls Slate Church home. But we also love every single person that does not yet call Slate Church home. We love this city. We love this country. We really believe that God has great plans and great things in store for this nation. That he has more to do in Canada than we have even seen happen yet. We just believe that we're going to see it and we're going to continue to just press into that. We're so excited for it. 
We're, we, you know, we just love that we get to be a part of this and we get to be a part of it with you. Truth is that this church is not built on us as lead pastors at all. But this church is actually built on the sacrifices of all of us, the sacrifices that we all make to build it week in and week out. And we're seeing God do amazing things. As you've been hearing, we've seen so many lives impacted. How awesome is this about baptisms and salvations week after week? It's just an incredible thing what's going on right now in our church. And I feel like preaching today. <laughs> Come on, I don't know what it is about this summer, this summer season come together, but I feel like preaching, okay? I mean, I'm fired up tonight, okay? I, I, I don't know how you feel right now, but, but, but I'm fired up. But hey, I, I want you to get fired up also, okay? Come on, I wonder if you can match my level of enthusiasm to deliver this message, your enthusiasm to hear this message, and we're going to see God move. So come on, let's lean into what he wants to do Let's get full of faith. Let's stir up our faith. And I believe that God is going to speak to us today. Let's not, be, let's not be spectators in church tonight, right? Come on, let's be participators in what God is going to do in this 6 o'clock service. All right? All right. I, I hope you charged up your Bibles last night. Because we're going to read <laughs> some scripture. I'm going to do it again. I, how many people brought a paper Bible? All right, that's more than last week. Praise God, we're on to something here. As I said last week, it doesn't matter what format it comes in. What actually matters is that we're reading it, right? Whether it's paper, whether it's on your phone, what actually matters is that we're diving into the word of God on a daily basis and that we're actually a biblically literate church, amen? We know what we're actually happy about. We know why, why we can thank God and praise him. Does that sound all right? Okay, uh, all right, why don't you turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 16. Last week, we read from the end of the book of Acts, this incredible story about Paul enduring a storm and a shipwreck and, and how God took him through that. And today, we're going to read from the middle of the book of Acts, and, uh, and we're going to read about another amazing and, and, quite frankly, a crazy story about Paul and about his great faith in God during a difficult moment in his life. And you know, this is actually one of my favorite stories of the entire New Testament. I think that this is just an incredible, incredible story. And it, it, Paul, um, you know, if you don't know who he was, he was probably one of the most impactful people at actually establishing the Christian church. And uh, the New Testament, what we're going to read from, is the part of the Bible that looks back on the life of Jesus. And we, we see in the book of Acts where the Christian church is established, and it starts to spread throughout the world at that time. And Paul was very influential in making that happen. He would travel around on missionary journeys, and he would start churches in all kinds of places. And it actually convicts me when, when I think about Paul, and I wonder what Paul would think of us today with our social media and the internet and YouTube and Instagram and, and all these other avenues that we have to actually communicate the gospel and get the word of God out there. And, and Paul, all he had was a donkey and some roads, right? That's all that he had. But look at what he was able to accomplish. And I'm not trying to minimize the donkey and the roads. It was actually very significant at that time. In fact, he was using the latest breaking technology to get the word of God out there when he was traveling on these Roman roads. But I hope that you feel as convicted as I do as wondering how, how are we getting the word of God out, taking advantage of the technology that we have available to us to actually communicate the gospel. So Acts 16. Beginning at verse 22, says this. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen behind me. It says this, 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. 
The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Verse 34, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Come on, why don't we pray tonight? Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for what you are doing here in this service right now. Lord, we welcome you here. I pray, God, that you would move in this place tonight in a powerful way. Lord, I just pray that although I'm going to be saying these words, I pray that you would be speaking these words. And Jesus, I, would, I pray that we would just receive what it is that you have to say tonight. And everybody said, Amen. come on, everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, um, perspective is an interesting thing, isn't it? Perspective is really that lens through which we see the world. Perspective is that lens through which we see our circumstance. It's the lens through which we see our situations. In many ways, our perspective is how we view ourselves as well. And all of us have different perspectives on things, and oftentimes our perspective is actually influenced by our experiences. But we all have unique perspectives in this place. Truth is that you and I have different perspectives on all kinds of different issues and all kinds of different things in in life. And that's fine. I think it's good that we have these unique perspectives. It's it's a good thing. But I have seen uh, this modeled, I guess you could say, uh, nowhere so more apparently than than in marriage, right? (laughs) My wife and I have different perspectives on many different things. But I think one thing we have a differing perspective on that is The largest is around food, all right? See, my wife, Victoria, is a total foodie. Any foodies in the house? All right, yeah. Whoa. Jeez, somebody is just, like, excited about food over there. That was awesome. Um, Victoria's a total foodie, right? Like, when she eats food, she's not just, like, eating food, but she's, like, tasting flavors, right? Like, she's, she, she's, she's like, trying to, like, like, savor it in her mouth, and she's, like, oh, like, the top notes of this are just so amazing. Can you taste those flavors? And it develops over time in my mouth, and it just is so amazing. And she's, like, she's, like, just holding the food in her mouth, and I'm just looking at her, like, just swallow your food, right? Like, what are you doing? And, she, you know, the way she talks about food and she's passionate about food and she loves to cook food and she gets all the nicest ingredients and all the spices and all the flavors and every meal should be this gourmet experience for her and it's just this incredible thing and, and I'm just like sitting eating my craft dinner like, what's your deal, right? Like, uh, <laughs> like there's no such thing as like a craft dinner lunch for Victoria or even like a peanut butter sandwich lunch, right? Like, like for her, that's not food, right? And, and so for, for us, there's this difference in perspective when it comes to food. For me, I'm not that into food. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like to eat food. But for me, it's just like a means of fueling my body, right? Really, if I could probably just take a pill that was my food for the day, I would do that. And I know some of you right now are just judging me so hard, but, <laughs> but don't, okay? I don't love food the way that she loves food, and, and I think that that's really visible in the way that we approach breakfast, and it's probably the fact that she is Swedish that she approaches breakfast in the way that she does, and I remember living in Sweden. Swedes uh, approach breakfast very differently than what I'm used to approaching breakfast. In, in Sweden, uh, and by the way, if you're writing notes, this you can write this down as a recipe, okay? Uh, in Sweden, they take crisp bread for breakfast, and they put some butter on it, and then they put cheese on it. And I'm not talking about just, like, normal cheese, okay? I'm talking about, like, the stinkiest cheese that you can find, okay? First thing in the morning, super stinky cheese on some hard bread, okay? Then they top it off with cucumbers and red peppers, okay? Uh, doesn't stop there. Then there's a lot of eggs involved, okay? Soft-boiled eggs that are held in these little egg holders, which you, like, hit with your spoon to, like, crack open. But then they go further. 
they take this caviar in a tube and they just start squirting it out all over the egg, okay? And I'm talking like at a ratio of like, I know this morning I said one to one, but I'm gonna say like five parts caviar to one part egg, okay? It's more like they're having caviar with a little bit of egg on top. And so there's just all this caviar on this, on this soft boiled egg. And then, all right, this is just one meal for a Swede in the morning. And then they've got this like sour milk yogurt concoction thing, which they put a bunch of like fruit and berries and, and, and oatmeal on and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and that's what they, and then they've got this thing that is pickled herring, okay? Like raw little pieces of pickled fish that they will eat as well. And uh, I know that there's some of you here and you're actually thinking, that sounds pretty good, right? And uh, if that's you, great. Feel free to go and talk to Victoria about it after service. You guys can bond over your weird food tastes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but none of you have had to try and wake up at 7 in the morning and get eggs full of caviar down your throat, okay? And neither have I because I refused to do it the whole time that I was there. There was no way that I was doing that, all right? It wasn't about to happen. I, I'm sorry. You know, for me, when I approach breakfast, my perspective is very simple, and there's only one thing on my mind at breakfast, and that is cereal. Come on, where are my cereal people at? Where are the, come on, don't be ashamed. In the morning service, people were like, I can't raise my hand. Like, you, like I know I'm trying to be healthy. I'm on like the keto diet. You know, I can't raise my hand. It's okay. You can love cereal still. It's all right. Uh, come on. I, I love cereal, right? I, I, can have, I, I can have sugar crisp for breakfast. I can have Captain Crunch at lunch, Honey Nut Cheerios for dinner, and Honeycomb as a bedtime snack. No problem, right? I, I, I love it. I come from a long, hey, here's the cereal people if you're wondering. Right over here. All right. These are God's chosen people right here in these first two rows. But, but, but uh, come on, cereal people. I, do you remember the, the good old days of cereal commercials when we were allowed to show cereal commercials on TV? Do you remember the good old days when you'd pour out your box of alphabets and a toy would pop out? Come on. As if cereal couldn't get any better, they decide to put a toy at the bottom of the box. It's amazing. And that's kind of how I approach breakfast. The only problem is that there's little to no, there may even be negative nutritional value in cereal. So thank God that I have a wife who actually cooks good food and makes sure that I eat uh, something that is better than cereal and actually get some nutrients in my body. I, I am very thankful for that actually. And by the way, if you're single, here's a pro tip. Uh, find yourself a spice who not only makes you better, but, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just in recipe mode right now. If you're single, find yourself a spice. A, a spice. Find yourself a spouse. I got it this time. <laughs> Find yourself a spouse who not only makes you better, but who also makes better food than you, okay? It's actually an important thing. And, and so um, I, that's what I have in Victoria. Praise God for her. And there's all these different perspectives w w when it comes to food. And uh, in reality, as is true of most things in, our, in my life and in our relationship, Victoria's perspective is the healthier and much smarter one. And so I'm doing what I can to actually shift my perspective so that I don't die of cereal overdose or something like that. Uh, but the point is, perspective matters. Perspective matters. The way you view things in life matters. And it's important that we are in control of our perspective. You know, you might not be able to control every situation in your life. You might not be able to control everything that comes at you. You might not be able to control every problem you face, but you can control your, res your, pers your perspective. We can be in control of our perspective. And if you're taking notes tonight, I want you to title this message, The Power of perspective. 
Why don't you turn to your neighbor and tell them you've got perspective. And I think it's important that we begin to see things from God's perspective. You know, if you're anything like me, you probably spend a lot more time trying to get God to see things from your perspective, right? God, if you only knew how busy I was, if you only knew what I was going through, if you could only see things the way that I see them, then you would understand why I'm not reading my Bible. Then you would understand why I don't feel like going to church. Then you would understand why I just can't serve at a team and slay church. You would, you would get it, God. If you just saw things through my perspective, it would make sense to you. But we actually need to flip that and start to see things through God's perspective. We need to start to see things through a higher perspective, a perspective that sees possibility, a perspective that sees through the lens of grace and purpose. This is the type of perspective that we need to bring into every single situation in our lives. You see, your perspective will either confine you or it will commission you. Come on, I'm going to say that again. Your perspective will either confine you or it will commission you. It will either confine you to the way that things are in your life or it will release you to the way that things can be. Come on, you need to make sure that you're checking your perspective daily. Make a daily habit of checking your perspective. I know it's good to get in the daily habit of brushing your teeth. I know it's good to brush your hair. I know it's good to do all those things, but you also need to make sure that it's a daily habit for you to check your perspective. Is your perspective that of which God has, or is it a perspective that you have just given to yourself? Has your perspective been clouded and crowded by what the world is saying about you, by what your salary says about you, by what your past says about you, by what sickness says about you, by what your struggle says about you? Or do you look through the perspective that God has of you? And you know, I love seeing people come to church. I, I, I love seeing everybody here because one of the greatest things about church is that it's actually an investment into your perspective. It's actually a place where you can realign your perspective to that of God's perspective about you. It's like getting an alignment done on your car, and it actually sets things straight, and it actually allows you to head down the road of life towards what God has for you without swerving this way and that because your perspective is all out of whack. You know, sometimes we experience things in our lives, and, you know, we'll say, that changed my life. <laughs> Is anybody guilty of that, over-exaggerating that statement, that changed my life, that was life changing? I do this all the time, right? I'll come out of a movie. It wasn't even that good of a movie. I'll be talking to somebody. It changed my life. You need to see, right? I I'll get out of a restaurant. I'll be like, listen, that restaurant changed my life. You got to go to this restaurant and try their food, right? And, uh, well, <laughs> it hasn't changed my life, but it probably has changed my wife's life, okay? Because she actually cares about the food that's going on there. But, but we over-exaggerate this statement. It changed my life all the time. It, it was life-changing. It was, it was incredible. When in reality, it may not have been actually all that life-changing at all, but perhaps it changed your perspective. See, your condition may have remained the exact same, but all of a sudden you perceived it differently, and it feels like everything has completely changed in your life. But some people, maybe you're here today, and if you were honest with yourself, you're trapped in certain ways of living that are the result of an incorrect perspective. But I want you to know today that the Word of God has the ability to take that wrong perspective and put it back on course to shift your perspective away from past memories that haunt you, to shift your perspective away from thoughts of the future that intimidate you, to shift your perspective off of insecurities that overwhelm you, and to place your perspective into the proper perspective of who God says that you are, of what he says that you can do, and all that you can be because he loves you. See, when you realize it, that God loves you, and when you realize that he wants to be in relationship with you, it completely changes your perspective. 
See, when you recognize that you're in relationship with an all-sufficient God, suddenly you don't see your lack, you see your fulfillment. Suddenly you don't see your problems, but you see your opportunity. And you're able to lift up your voice in worship. And you're able to praise him for what he has done for you. And every area of your life is filled with his power and his presence. Because your perspective recognizes that no weapon formed against you can prosper. It recognizes that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Come on, some of us need a perspective shift in this place tonight. And I believe that Acts 16 shows us this amazing example of perspective. I love it so much. You know, this is a a passage of scripture that I have preached from before. I preached from this passage of scripture way back 10 months ago when our church was just a newborn. (laughs) We're still a baby. We're just 11 months. We're still talking about it in months, right, the way parents do. So that's, that means that we're, we're still just a baby. Um, but way back when we were just a newborn, right, just brought home from the hospital, I preached a message from this passage of Scripture. It was called At About Midnight. And I know that you all know that because you revisit your notes every single week and you listen to it every week on our podcast. I know. I don't have to tell you uh, about that message. But I preached this message, and and I think it was a a powerful message. But today, I want to approach it from a different perspective. I want to preach it from a new perspective. And, And I've been loving reading about the life of Paul lately. And I think that there is so much that we can learn from Paul. And we can learn from his Christ centered perspective when it came to life. And ministry. And so Paul and Silas are out preaching the gospel in a place called Philippi. Everybody say Philippi. And the crowd there, they begin to attack him. And I think that there's something that we can learn even from this because the fact is that whenever we are advancing in life and whenever we are taking the message of Jesus forward, we shouldn't be too surprised when we come into, uh, when we come face to face with opposition, when we come face to face with things that try and stop us. And that's because we are actually moving the kingdom of God forward, right? And the truth is the enemy doesn't have to worry about people who aren't doing anything because people who aren't doing anything are not a threat. But whenever we are advancing the kingdom of God, we shouldn't be so surprised when we face opposition at times. And, and really what's going on in this whole scene, it, it really comes down to a race issue. You see, Paul and Silas, they were Roman citizens, but they were also Jews. And for the first time, Paul and Silas are in Europe preaching the gospel. And they ended up in Europe because we see that in Acts 15... Just one chapter earlier, they had planned and they had tried to go to Asia, but God told them not to go to Asia, that that's not what they were going to do. And Paul had a vision of somebody in Macedonia calling out to them. And so they decided to change their route, and instead they found themselves going to Europe and to Macedonia. And I also love, by the way, that what they had planned to do, what they had set out to do, was not what they had done because God had another destination in store for them. And last week we learned about the fact that sometimes in life things that seem like a detour is actually the destination that God has for us. And I think that even today this is a word for somebody. that uh, You you might be on a totally different place than what you were planning to go to, but you need to recognize that that is a destination where God needs you to be at. It is actually not a detour in your life. And maybe you've been here today and you're sitting here and you feel like you've been rejected from what you've been planning on doing. But how many people know that rejection, when viewed through the proper perspective, is really just redirection? Isn't that right? And suddenly you understand it wasn't a rejection at all, but it was actually just God positioning you in a place to do what he needs you to do there. So don't get so worried that 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 relationship didn't turn out the way that you thought it would turn out. Don't get so worried that you didn't get that job. Don't get so worried that you didn't get into that program at school. Come on, change your perspective. It's not a, it's not a rejection. It's just an opportunity for redirection in your life. And believe that God is positioning you, that he is setting you up to do something in a place that maybe you didn't plan on doing. Maybe it feels like a detour. But he needs you in that place here and now to do what he is calling you to do. Amen. And I also love 
that, uh, <coughs> that, that, that when they go uh, from Asia over to Europe, I love that they are truly breaking new ground on a continent. I just think that there's something so powerful in that. And so they head to Europe this area of Macedonia, specifically in a place called Philippi, and they're traveling around to preach, but they're being followed by this young girl who, who the Bible says is filled with an evil spirit. And in Acts 16, 17, we read that she's mocking them. She's taunting them. It seems like she's saying good things, but really she's just saying things sarcastically. Paul ends up getting so fed up that he turns around and he just commands the spirit to leave the girl, right? Which, which again, I think is just an amazing image of the power that we have when the Holy Spirit lives within us to confront things of darkness and actually just say, you have no power here. You need to leave. I think, it's, I think it's an incredible image of that happening. I think, I think it's amazing. But, of course, the, the men who were essentially pimping this young girl out were not so happy because this girl was a source of income for them. She was a, she was a fortune teller, and all of a sudden these guys lost their source of income. And so they're not happy. And they start to incite the crowd. And they get everybody riled up, and they say, hey, who do these guys think they are? These are Jews, and this is Rome. We're, we're in Rome right now. We don't need this Jewish gospel of Jesus in Rome. And they get the crowd angry and everybody gets uh, upset at them. And, and it, it's like a riot is breaking out. And they take them before these men called the magistrates. And the magistrates were supposed to be the keepers of peace. And, and, and they have them beaten. And they have them stripped of their clothes. And they are humiliated in the streets. And, you know, as I was reading this, I, I was just wondering I was feeling like perhaps you're here today and you have felt stripped of your self-worth before. Maybe you're here and you've been stripped of your health before. Maybe you've been stripped of your enthusiasm. Maybe you've been stripped of your passion. Maybe you're here today and like Paul and Silas, you've been beaten before. Maybe not necessarily physically, but maybe you've been beaten by sin. Maybe you've been beaten by addiction, beaten by habits. Maybe you've been beaten by other people's words. Maybe you've even been beaten by your own thoughts. We read in verse 24 that they were thrown into prison. And not just into prison, but they were thrown into the inner cell. And their feet were fastened in stocks. They were chained up. But in just a minute, we're about to see how even when we might feel like we are chained up by our circumstance, God is getting ready for a chain reaction of his power and his love, and he is going to move in a mighty way. See, Paul and Silas were in prison, but I, I love these guys so much, and I love their example of faith in this difficult situation. I love their perspective in the prison. See, even though they were in prison, they weren't prisoners. <laughs> Although they were in prison, they, they weren't prisoners there because they recognized that the spirit of the Lord was with them in that place. And we know that the Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is frustration. <laughs> now that doesn't sound right, does it? No, no, it's... It says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is fear. No, that's not right either. <laughs> right, the, right, the Bible says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is failure, right? No, come on, that's not what it says either. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.17 that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And come on, I don't know what chains you feel are on your life in this place tonight. I don't know what kind of prison you might feel like you are in tonight. I have news for you. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place tonight, here and now. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So you can get ready tonight. Whatever chains your feet might be in, they're about to fall to the floor in the name of Jesus Christ because there is freedom in this place. If you believe it, you need to make a little bit of noise in this place tonight. Praise God. Praise God. 
There is freedom. You can be seated. Maybe you're sitting there, you, 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 you know, you, you feel this way, but you really believe that this is your night. Paul and Silas are sitting there together. They're in the prison. It's in the middle of the night. Really, they should be asleep. All of a sudden, all the other prisoners in the jail, they start to hear something. They can't believe their ears, and they're saying, are you hearing what I'm hearing? Do you hear that? I, I don't know if you, you hear that. It's the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, they start to hear singing. They start to hear praising. They start to hear prayer, worship. And that's because Paul and Silas, although they are bound in chains, and although they are in the inner cell of the jail, they are singing praises to God. Look at this perspective that they have. <laughs> They're locked in the circumstance, but that's okay. My feet are locked up. I can't move, but my voice isn't locked up. I can still praise God. I can't get out of this prison cell, but that's okay. I can still lift my eyes to God above. You know, they couldn't control their situation, but they could control their perspective in the middle of it. And they didn't focus on the fact that they were bound, but they focused on what was still free. You see, if you just focus on what is bound in your life, it's going to remain locked up. But instead, focus on what you can do. Shift your perspective in the prison and start to praise. <clears throat> Come on, I might, I might not be able to walk, but I, I can still praise God. Come on, my, my finances might be tight, but that doesn't stop me from being able to serve in church. Come on, you need to use what's free to shake the chains of what's bound. Come on, I'm going to say that again. Use what's free to shake the chains of what's bound. And so they begin to sing loud. They begin to sing so loud that all the other prisoners are listening to them. And I wonder if you caught that. <laughs> One commentator that I was reading, he, 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 he wrote that this is, this is interesting because everybody else likely would have been asleep at this time. And it's likely that they would have been awoken by the praise of Paul and Silas. And they all start to hear it. And I think this is so significant because I truly believe that as we begin to lift up our voice in praise, even though you might be in the middle of a prison, even though you might be chained up and you don't know how you're going to get out of that situation, if you would shift your perspective and start to praise God, I believe that there are people who are all around you in life who are right now asleep to what God wants to do. And I believe as you begin to lift up your voice and praise God, that they are going to wake up and their eyes are going to open to what God wants to do in their life. I believe that as we, as a church, begin to praise the name of Jesus louder than ever, that a city that might be a little bit asleep to what God is going to do is going to wake up and is going to begin to see what God is going to do in this city. But we got to praise God even in the prison. They've been singing and praising God and something absolutely amazing happens. All of a sudden, the foundations of the prison begin to shake. and God sends an earthquake and all of a sudden, they're, 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 God is, is shaking and he's breaking the foundation of that which they are bound to. And maybe today you're facing some shaking in your life. Maybe you feel like you, you built a strong foundation for yourself, but things haven't been going your way and things have started to shake and you don't know what's going on and you're wondering what's happening. And God, but, but I want you to know that, that, that God might be shaking that foundation in order to break the chains off of your life that are holding you back from everything that he needs you to do. He's shaking the foundation of that which you are bound to. And we see that suddenly everyone's chains came loose. Everyone in the whole prison, it was a chain reaction. Come on. Church, you got to know that our praise has the power to break chains in our lives. Our praise has the power to break whatever it is that's holding you back, to shake the foundation of whatever 
it is that you are bound to. Come on, you need to wake up every single day and you need to look yourself right in the mirror and you need to tell yourself, my praise can break my chains. My praise has the power to break chains off of my life. My praise has the power to break those chains of addiction. My praise has the power to break those chains of sin. My praise has the power to break the chains of insecurity and to shake that foundation on which I am bound to. Praise is the power to break chains. Come on, don't let your chains hold your praise captive. Let it loose. Maybe tonight you were even standing here in worship and you felt like you couldn't even praise God at all because you're bound by something in life, because you feel like you're, 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 you've got chains on you in life and you're not worthy to be able to praise the name of Jesus. Friend, you need to know, you gotta lift up your voice and praise him even when it doesn't feel like the right time to do it, even though you might feel like you're in the prison and watch your praise break those chains. Come on, don't let your praise, don't let your chains tell your praise how high it can go. <laughs> Imagine if Paul and Silas had a perspective where their chains held back their praise. Silas is there, hey, Paul, this sucks, doesn't it? Paul's like, yeah, this sucks, man. I, come on, I thought God had our back. I, I thought we were, I mean, we were doing his work. We're, we're preaching the gospel, and here we are in prison. Should we just give this up? Yeah, maybe we should give this up. I don't need to be in prison again. I don't feel like being shipwrecked one more time. Imagine if that was their perspective. I mean, who could blame them? <laughs> but they had a higher perspective. I've heard it said by a pastor before that the decisions you're making are the results of the conversations you're having. And the conversations you're having are the results of the connections that you've made. And the connections that you've made define the perspective that you have. Come on, get yourself surrounded with some people in life that lift your perspective, who help you see things the way that God sees things, who can speak life into you, who can have conversations with you, the type of people you can praise with, the type of people you can pray with. You know, the jailer made a mistake when they put Paul and Silas in the same jail cell, right? Because all of a sudden they're in there together and they're encouraging one another and they're like, we're going to praise God together. We're going to pray with one another. Get yourself surrounded with those kind of people. Get yourself into a connect group at Slate Church. People who want to lift you up. People who want to speak life into you. People who want to see you succeed. People who want to see, help you see yourself the way that God sees you. They were able to praise God when they couldn't move and they were able to hope when they couldn't see because as we know they were free even before their chains fell off. They had a freedom perspective that said you can lock up my body but my spirit is free and alive because of Jesus Christ. Their perspective was not defined by their pain. Their perspective was defined by their purpose. The gospel had not yet been to Europe, and now God was about to set free the gospel message across the continent, but in order to do that, Paul and Silas had to get locked up. And while the foundations of the prison were shaking, God was establishing a foundation of faith across the continent of Europe. Come on, when the foundations are being shaken in our lives, it's because God is establishing a greater foundation. If you're experiencing some shaking here today, if you're experiencing some shackles in your life, I just want to remind you of God's purpose for you. It stands firm. Your perspective in the prison gives your pain a purpose. Come on, your perspective in the prison gives your pain a purpose. The jailer who was guarding them he came to the jail and after the jail cells had been flung open and he was so terrified, he was so ashamed, he thought it was his fault that, that he, he was going to kill himself. But Paul said, stop! We're all still here. Don't do it. We're, we're all here. It's not your fault. We're still here. And this is strange, isn't it? Come on, if you're in prison and all of a sudden the, the doors fling open, I don't know about you, but I'm getting out of there as fast as I can, right? I'm out of that place. But, but they didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? Because they recognized their purpose. 
See, they didn't view their freedom as a means of escape. They saw it as an opportunity to witness. Come on, isn't this just classic Paul? What amazing faith. He's like, yeah, I'm free. I can leave. But there's a guy in here who needs to hear about the name of Jesus and who needs to hear that he loves him. Paul's perspective was connected to his purpose. Paul didn't see his prison as a prison. Paul saw the prison as a platform. The guard asked in a moment, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas say, just believe that he is the Lord. Just believe in him. And this man, he does that and he was so overwhelmed that he personally escorts Paul and Silas out of the prison and he takes them to his house. Now suddenly that thing that was holding them captive is actually being used to further the purpose that God had. And this man's whole family was saved. And these are some of the very first Christians in all of Europe. And I just love that this man and his family were saved because Paul had a perspective that allowed him to praise in the prison. and allowed them to step into the purpose that God had intended. You got to keep your perspective. Those chains are going to fall off your life for a purpose. Come on, don't waste that purpose. When God sets you free, don't think it's only for your freedom. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. But I wonder whose freedom stands on the other side of your praise. Come on, I wonder whose salvation is on the other side of your obedience in this place tonight. Amen. You got to start to see that prison as your platform. Come on, friend, you got to know that God has a purpose for you tonight. Even if you might find yourself in a prison, even though you might feel like you're in chains, even though you don't know what the way forward is, God has a purpose for you. And I believe that as you begin to praise him and lift up his name in the middle of that situation, as you shift your perspective, that you will see those chains fall to the floor and that you will experience freedom and that your freedom can actually be a testimony and it can lead to the salvation of other people. And we're going to see God do incredible things through us as we shift our perspective. You got to shift your perspective. You got to recognize your purpose. Can we all stand up in this place tonight? Come on, why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray for two groups of people. I ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads because this is a, a private moment. We don't want to manipulate anybody. We don't need anybody looking around at all. But the first group of people I want to pray for tonight is anybody who has not made a decision to make Jesus Christ their Savior. Maybe you've never made that decision to say, I want to follow Jesus. I, I, I want to make that commitment. I, I, I recognize that he's the Lord of my life. I recognize that he's got a purpose for me. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you're in chains. Maybe you feel like you're bound. I believe that some chains are going to fall to the floor right now in this moment. And this is your moment. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And in just a, just a second, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm just going to ask you, if you want me to pray for you, just quickly raise up your hand. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you, nothing like that. I just want to know who I'm praying for tonight. So if that's you, you say, Luke, I, I want to make a commitment to follow Jesus. When I get to three, just, just raise your hand and you can put it down. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Three, if that's you, would you just quickly raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Praise God. Amen. I see that hand. I see those hands. Praise God. I see that hand over here. Praise God. Praise God. That's awesome. You can put that in your hands. I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm just going to ask that you would repeat this after me. We're going to all say this together as a church, but if you raise your hand, I just want you to pray this right from your heart to Jesus because he is listening tonight. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my life. I love you. Forgive me of my sin. I want to follow after you for all of my days. In your name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, church, we can celebrate a little bit more. Praise God. Praise God. 
just a moment, Pastor Brandon is going to come back. And if you made that decision, he's got some more information for you. But I want to pray for one more group of people. So if I could have every head bowed and I close once more. I want to pray for anybody tonight. Maybe you feel like you need a shift in your perspective. If that's you right now, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Praise God, hands up all over this place. Come on. Jesus, thank you so much for every person with their hand raised. God, I just pray right now that they would be able to have a shift of perspective, that they would begin to see things the way that you see them. Jesus, I pray that they would have a higher perspective. Jesus, they, they would recognize what you are calling them to do. Father, I don't know what kind of prisons people are in. I don't know what kind of chains people are bound by, but you do. And I pray that as they lift their perspective, and as they begin to praise you, even in the prison, God, that you would shake the foundations of that which they are bound to, and that they would be able to step in to all that you have planned for them, to all that you have purposed them for. And Jesus, I just pray that we will see so many lives change and impacted because of their decisions tonight. We thank you for what you're doing, God. And everybody said, amen. Thanks so much amen. for watching. If you were impacted by the message today, you can send us an email at mystory@slatechurch.com. And if you'd like to learn more, you can fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you at one of our Sunday services and make sure to stay connected by following us on any of our social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.